your journey of you <laughs> equals joy. Now, I need to tell you about my journey. It did not look like joy for a very long time. It looked like a lot of things. Panic attacks, anxiety, osteoporosis, just like it was a mess. Depression, that was my worst. But I, you know, about a year and a half ago, <clears throat> I watched my two little granddaughters, and uh, they were visiting, and the older one was about maybe three years old, maybe three, and the other one was just starting to walk, and she couldn't even talk. And they were in, in the house, and the older one accidentally turned on the radio, full volume. Freaked her out. She went, ah! And her baby sister took one look at her, and she was just learning how to walk. This little girl took one look at her sister and said, I don't know. I mean, like, you could just see the wheels turning. Like, I don't know what just happened, but it's bad. And she went, ah! And they both started running around the kitchen. <laughs> ah! Now, I had like one of those moments, you know how you have one of those moments when like the world changes? And I thought, Sadie just caught fear. She doesn't know what it is. It's nothing bad, but she just caught it like a cold. And I, and you know, I always thought I was afraid of real things. And I thought, maybe I caught fear. Maybe you caught fear. And I started to live inside this question, because I love questions, and I always have a good question running in the background, like a computer scan. Running in the, and the question was, who was I before I caught fear? I have lived my life as though I was a fearful person. But I started to ask, who was I? And I started to think, well, maybe I was adventurous. I like new stuff. I, I started to wonder about that. And then time went by, and a friend invited me to Limitless. By that point, I had decided I'm fearless. And she invited me to Limitless, and I'm very busy. So I thought to myself, I am like way too busy to do this. But you know, something inside of me said, this is important, pay attention, go. So I went. And I'd like to ask if there's anybody here who has had that feeling, a little feeling inside, this is important. Like before I even went, I knew this, I should go and do this. So I went to that. And I learned about beliefs. And I learned how the beliefs in our life run our life. <coughs> They're like the computer code behind the scenes that runs the program. So I started to take on the thought of what else have I believed? I mean, I believed in fear for, for over 60 years. I believed in fear that that's who I am. Not the clothes I wear, but, you know, anybody remember Mr. Rogers? It's not the clothes you wear. Well, beliefs. You know, so I started to think, in, 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 through Limitless, I started to think, what are the clothes that I put on that I carry around with me? And I thought about my very first memory, one of my very first memories about being on this planet. I was at my grandma's house, and I was cute, and I was named after her, Grandma Felicia. And she wanted to bring me to see her, her brother and sister. And, and, and so she put this cute little sunsuit on me, the cutest little sunsuit. And it had no top. And I was so embarrassed. Now remember, I was so young, I didn't have, like, I couldn't talk to her about this. I was just like, I knew something is wrong here. I should have a top. And I said, in my baby language, which didn't come out in words, I said, ah! And I cried and I cried and that was inconsolable and my aunt came over to me. And she said, what is it? What is it? And I said, help me! <laughs> 
hey, but I didn't say it in words. I said it in, ah, I screamed. And she helped me, and she got me a shirt so I could go out in public. That's the first time that I know of that I put on a belief. Now, that's not, not the first time I put on a belief. It's the first time I know of. There's probably ones that go way before that. But I put on the shirt and pants of shame. I know by that point in my life, I was embarrassed and I didn't want to be seen out in public with no shirt. So I got my shirt and then I lived in a household, I was, I was so shy. I mean, the whole idea of being up here is like crazy. So in my household, I like to hide under the furniture. Anybody here hide under furniture when you were little? Well, I used to hide under the kitchen table, and they had tablecloths in those days. So the tablecloth would come down, and I would hide under the tablecloth and pretend I wasn't there, and I would listen to what the grown-ups were saying. <clears throat> and I heard lots of good stuff, because they didn't know I was there. But I hid under, let me see what this says. You have to, like, you have to do research to find out your beliefs. This one is the cloak of invisibility. You know, I used to hide under the furniture, under the table, under the, under the bed. I used to hide all over the place, but I could also hide in plain sight. I could be so quiet, nobody knew I was there. Nobody knew I was there at all. I could hide in a room like this. Anybody look good at hiding? Well, I could hide in plain sight, and this was my cloak of invisibility. Well. I lived in, a, I was one of, at that point, I was one of four kids. A lot of stuff going on. My mom got married when she was 18. Love my mom so much. But she had a lot going on in her life, and she was working two jobs, and she was scared about the finances, and she was just like really stressed out. And we had four kids in a four-room apartment in New York City. So there was a lot of, be quiet, you know, just, I learned fear. I learned duck before you get, you know, I grew up in the 50s. In the 50s, it was a different experience. I mean, there was a lot of, of you know, if you discipline your children, it's because you love them. So there was a lot of discipline in my house, and I learned to put on the helmet of fear. The helmet of fear comes with instructions. It says, if the sun is shining, know that it's going to rain soon. Something bad is coming. And when I was hiding under the table, I also learned that maybe dad's business was going to shut down. Now, bear with me because I'm hoping that this microphone still works after I put on the helmet of fear. Are we still good? Awesome. Awesome. Well, the helmet of fear was very helpful, and I used to use it all the time. <clears throat> but it wasn't just in my house. I mean, it was a fearful time. I mean, we had the Russians, we had world events, and things were always going on. I, li I went to school in a time where you were taught to hide under your desk in case of nuclear attack. And if you hide under your desk, I don't know what they thought that was going to do for you. <laughs> But we were taught by those in authority to be afraid and to hide. So the next thing I picked up, the next belief I have, I think this was probably at least by the age of five, is the scarf of silence. The scarf of silence is also called being polite. Never say anything that will hurt someone's feelings. Um, it also came with, don't ask, the answer is no. Respect your elders and never contradict them. Privacy, do not tell anyone our business. Don't even play over someone else's house because then they'll want to play at your house. Don't talk about it. The scarf of silence is incredibly powerful. I made up a story, it was because we were Italian and Italians have the law of silence. 
Is there anybody in this room that grew up in a household that had the law of silence? The scarf, the scarf of silence. All right, let's see now if we can do this and you can still hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Well, it's not because I'm not trying to hide. The scarf of silence is pretty effective. But it was, it was tough inside the scarf of silence because everybody in my house wore the scarf of silence. And I was in my 20s and on my first job before I realized that if I farted, someone could hear me or smell it because nobody talked about stuff in my house. If there was crying, it was behind closed doors. And when they came out, we would pretend nothing happened. Well, I got pretty, as I grew older, I got angry. I got very angry. And it colored my whole world dark. And I put on the sunglasses of anger. And then with the sunglasses of anger came, it's not fair. You ruined my life. And I believed it was because we were Italian. Yet, you know, and I decided that everybody in my house was crazy and I had to run away. So I ran away to grandma's house. I didn't get very far. They did bring me back. And I thought, well, surely now something would change. But no, you see, nothing could change because we had the scarf of silence. So we couldn't talk about it. So we lived in a volcano house. Anybody here live in a volcano house? A volcano house is when things get so bad that, boom, something blows up. But then nothing happens. Nothing changes. I was in the world of anger. But when I was hiding under the table, I learned a lot of really good stuff from the grown-ups. I learned that there was not enough money <clears throat> that maybe my dad's business was going uh, gonna have to like shut down. I didn't know what we were gonna do. The, I picked up the purse of scarcity. Anybody here have the purse of scarcity? Oh my, suffering, poverty, bill collectors. Don't answer that phone. You never know who might be calling. Not enough, not enough money, not enough food, not enough heat, not enough hot water. Did you ever live in a house with not enough hot water? I mean, it came with a lot of anxiety, and I picked up the habit of hoarding in my purse of scarcity, which I carried with me everywhere. And then, <clears throat> when I was 11, when I was 11, I, oh, I hope, I wouldn't wish this on anybody. I peed my pants in school. Has that ever happened to anybody? Well, I decided I was gonna hide. So I went into the girls' room and I hid. And I put on the, see, the pants of shame come in layers. You don't have just one layer. Well, I had the pants of shame and I was hiding in the, in the girls' room. I hid there for like at least an hour and a half. I don't know why they didn't send in somebody after me, but I hid there until school ended. And I said, I gotta die in here. Like, if I don't, I mean, I can't go out. I can never see those people again. So I was gonna try to jump out the window, but it was on the first floor. And I thought, it's not going, you know? And it was locked, otherwise I would have gone out the window. And, and so I said, okay, I'll pretend I'm gonna get on the bus. So I pretended to get on the bus, but I didn't get on the bus, I walked home. Four miles and squishy tennis shoes. <laughs> squish, 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 squish. And all the way home, all the way home, I locked in my belief that I was wearing the Italian pants of shame. But then, I became a teenager, and I knew that I was supposed to wear one of these. But I had no need. 
because I was so skinny. I was so skinny that for six years I waited to become a woman and it didn't happen. And I said, oh my gosh, God made a mistake. I'm not really a girl. But when you say something like that, it changes from God made a mistake to I am a mistake. So I put on the bra of body shame. Now, it, it was too big. So I had to stuff it with Kleenex. And it would fall out. And people would say, excuse me, did you drop something? Oh no, not me, that's not my Kleenex. And, and I'm hiding under the furniture, only by this time I wasn't hiding under the table, I was hiding behind the furniture. I'd go in my room and I would sit behind the bed where, no, where if my mom looked in the room like nobody was in there, and I would read. <clears throat> I read a lot of stuff and I, and I listened to music and I listened to Barbara Streisand sing a song about freedom. And she sang, and, and her voice was incredible, and she sang, Bird up above, see what he got, freedom to fly, and the freedom to not. Deedum, that's a fine kind of freedom. I wanted that freedom. And I knew that if I could just get out of this nut house, I would have a life. So I waited. I waited until I was 18 years old and I left home and I went to college and I put on the dress of rebellion. <laughs> it was 1970. And it was just about the time when college campuses had all kinds of stuff going on. I mean, it was free love, it was hippies, and I thought, this is really cool. This is so cool, I am away from everyone that knows me. Now I can be my true self. My true self and I went to Boston and I got, went to college and I said, I am free at last. <clears throat> but you know, the world is a very scary place. So I needed to, I needed to live, I needed an apartment. The, the debt from college was killing me, $2,000 a year. So this is crazy. I can't sustain this level of debt. So I left college and I begged for a job. I had no idea how to find a job. I said, help me. Will you help me? Well, I got a job. My gosh, God was looking out for me. I got a job in a bank. Oh, I was so cool. I was a split personality. I was a banker during the day and a hippie at night. And I used to change in the ladies' room. I changed in the ladies' room and rode a motorcycle back and forth to school because I was so cool. Then the stock market crashed. And I was freaking out. I mean, I was a banker and I was trading stocks and I had an office on the 23rd floor overlooking Boston Harbor. The whole world was at my feet and I was absolutely freaking out. Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Help me. And oh my, you know what happened? God sent me Brian, my husband. He sent me Brian and Brian rescued me. He absolutely did. I, I am so grateful to him. I think I would be dead if it wasn't for Brian because it was a very, very dark time in my life. Oh, I'm sorry, I got a little mixed up here. I got a little mixed up because I put on the snow pants of shame. This was panic attacks, anxiety. I was so scared. I was not only scared, I was getting sick. Have you ever made yourself scared sick? Well, I have done this 
It was not pretty. But I was so grateful when Brian rescued me. I loved that man. I love him to this day. He still rescues me. He still supports me. And I was actually able to take off the raincoat of my professional identity as a banker. And I could stop being a hippie at last. And I was all set. But here's the problem. I had this belief that because he was such a great man, I should match him. I should be just like him. I wanted to be just like him. See, Brian's family was wealthy. Mine was poor. Brian's family was organized. Mine was a complete mess. Brian's family was Japanese. Mine was Italian. <sighs> now, you may not relate to the shame of being Italian. There are some people who are ashamed of being Samoan, or some people who are ashamed of being fat, or some people who are, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> I was ashamed of being Italian, and I knew that was the cause of all my problems. And if I could just be a Nagamatsu, Japanese, then I would be all set. So I literally put on Brian's clothing. Brian wears blue pants and a blue shirt every day of his life, except for Sunday where he puts on a white shirt. But I thought, if I'm going to be like Brian, I literally got blue pants and a blue shirt. I stopped wearing orange, green, purple, all my favorite colors, and I started looking and walking, and be I became organized. There was never dirty dishes in the sink. It was just like a wonderful, wonderful life. Our cars never break down. Everything works. And I love this man so much. We decided to have family. So I put on the bathrobe of motherhood. <laughs> now, I forgot to read the label on this, this here, the dress of rebellion, but that was when I decided that I would never get married. I would never have a family because I knew from watching my mom that motherhood was a trap and marriage was a terrible, terrible trap. And I never wanted to be like her. But I loved this man and we wanted a son, a family. Well, we had a son. I loved this boy so much. I loved him so much. I still do, he's still alive. I love him and I became so depressed. I became so sick. I absolutely lost myself. I put on the rock bottom coat of depression and despair. I was trapped. I could not leave this husband that I love. I could not walk away from this son that I adore. But I was also just at the bottom. Now, the problem is, I don't know if there's anybody in this room that's ever dealt with depression. It's cold. It's cold. You need boots to protect yourself. It's hard to move when you've got all this stuff on. You need gloves. And I rocked my baby. And I did my work. And I smiled in the pictures. And I said nothing. Because when you're depressed, you have no voice. I started to rock. I went into my own garden of Gethsemane and I said, He 
sent me a friend. And the friend said, come with me. Come and learn. Come and learn what God says. So I started to learn. I read the scriptures. It was tw 26 years ago. I became a, a fanatic detective for truth. I became a person who would not be stopped. And I started to take off. I took off the, sun, the uh, sunglasses of anger. I took off the gloves. I took off the depression. And I said, oh, that's so much better. And I went through my life for 26 years. I did everything in my power. I took medication for 25 years. It saved my life. But I felt like there was something else. Like, I, you know, I have, don't I have enough faith? I increased my faith. I put on the dress of faith. I thought I was with the most amazing people in church. I loved these people. I wanted to be just like them. I put on the matching dress of faith and I studied all the good holy people that I knew and I wanted to be just like them. This is about as far as I got. And, and if you'd look at me, I mean, those of you who did know me before, I joined Limitless, you'd think I was a very high-functioning human being. I mean, I have a lot to offer, I'm very smart, I'm kind of cute sometimes. But when I came to Limitless, I said, there's, there's something else. I used to tell Brian, I don't want to die yet. I can't face God and have him say, what did you do with your life? And I'd say, like, this is not enough. This is not enough, so I went to Limitless. I went to Limitless, and I saw all the amazing things that people were saying. And I had the sling of regret. This is the sling that says, it's too late. You're too old. Too much has happened to you. You've got too many injuries. You're all used up. But you know what? I didn't put it on. I said, no, there's something more for me, and I will find it. And I have studied for 26 years. I have done everything in my power. I have found truth and made it my own for this many years. And I know there's something going on here at Limitless, and I want it. And that's when, on July 29th, when I became a gladiator, there's inspired leadership in the health intensive program. There's inspired leadership in gladiators, not because they're great, but because they teach truth. And they taught me how to take off layers of false beliefs, old beliefs, beliefs about motherhood, beliefs that two weeks ago, two weeks ago, this layer came off, the one that says, I have to match my beloved husband. We are different. We are really different. I have gifts that Brian doesn't have, and he's got gifts for organization and that I'll never have. I've learned from him, he's learned from me, but no, we don't have to match. We don't have to match the shoes of depression, they can go. This layer of matching is probably one of the most important things I ever did. I took off the helmet of fear. I'm gonna shut down here now. Help me.
like I have no idea how this is going to work. But you're seeing like me. No. Maybe if I shout. I learned how to get help. I learned that when I need help, people show up. And they're so happy to help me. I needed a, a website, and Brian did it for me. Now, am I on? Am I on? Yes. Awesome. I got help. That's what happens. Brian made me a website, like, in two days. You know when I, how long it's going to take me? Like, never. It was never going to happen. The ski pants of shame. Oh, my gosh. It's so hot under here, I can't tell you. This is at least 15 pounds of beliefs. Now, here's a biggie about rebellion. You see, I don't need rebellion anymore because I'm not, like, I can just be me. I, if I'm my true self, then there's nothing to rebel against. I might need help again. Sometimes, rebellion doesn't come off without help. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh -huh. Dangling body parts here. I don't know. All right, so body shame. Everybody's got it. So just like, let's all take it off together. Ugh. But what I've learned, thank you. Thank you so much. The purse of scarcity came off when I signed up for gladiators. I had to like break that belief. Otherwise, I couldn't even put myself in the program. But here's the big one, the really, really big one, is the scarf of shame. The scarf of silence. It has to come off, because without the scarf of silence off, you cannot say, get me help. You cannot ask, you cannot know how many people love you. If you don't take off the cloak of invisibility, you will never know how much love and help there is in the world. Now, a couple of weeks into the Gladiator program, I was able to shed the Italian pants of shame. Something amazing happened when I shed that. When I shed the Italian pants of shame, I got my family back. I got my grandma. I got Italy. I got lasagna. <laughs> it's amazing how much I got back. I got me back. I think I'm right about here right now. There's always layers to come off. But I want you to know that I am dedicated to your journey of you equals joy. I will never shut up. I will, at this point in time, I know that you're always putting on and taking off layers. Like, I got the ballet shoes of being ridiculous. I mean, I'm in a dance recital in five weeks, and we are pathetic. But it's funny. It's not embarrassing. And I want you to know that I truly, with all my heart, tell you that when you take off all the layers of the beliefs, that underneath you are still there. I'm 64, I'm going to be 65 in May. I thought it was too late for me. It is, it is not too late. It's crackling. Not too late. Underneath, you are the same as that little girl who went, ah! It doesn't necessarily mean that something very bad happened. It doesn't have to be that there are bad guys in your life. I tell you this, your parents did the very best they could. I'm a parent, I know. I do the very best I can. It's ridiculously ineffective at some times. 
But I got my dad back. And here's the funny part. I got all the parts of me that are just like him. He was this most amazing entertainer. He was a joyful, joyful man. And I got me. I got me back. And you can too. And in today and tomorrow, you will have the opportunity to choose in to how you take off the layers. There's different ways to do it. But these inspired leaders, they can show you. And I am a witness. I stand as a witness that every time you take off a lie, you get power and you get energy. I came into this program and I decided that I was going to take on my health. I took on osteoporosis, pelvic prolapse, scoliosis. I don't know if you're familiar with scoliosis, but it is curvature of the spine. And this was my life before. Can you see this? This was my life before. I now know that I can stand up straight. It takes awareness. It takes determination. And if I falter, if I forget, I can be just as crippled as I used to be. But I don't have to be, and neither do you. And all the reasons and all the things that you think are in your way are way, way more the stuff you wore. And they are not you. And I tell you this with the bottom of my heart. Don't settle. Go on your journey and find your joy. Thank you.